I'm Dr. Bart Eastwood. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons with uh, Ortho Virginia. And uh, just to introduce a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm here in our Blacksburg, uh, Christiansburg uh, locations. We also have offices in, in Withville and Bluefield as far as our Southwest kind of coverage for Ortho Virginia. Ortho Virginia, though, is a large statewide organization, over 130 uh, physicians in it, really spanning the entire state of uh, Virginia. So I am one of our fellowship trained sports medicine and arthroscopic surgeons. Uh, we have several of us across all of our locations in Virginia. And sometimes people even have a question, you know, about our, our training. So all orthopedic surgeons do a residency, which is five years of advanced surgical training. And additionally, you can do a fellowship, which is a, a year long specialized a year in, uh, in, in, in such as hand or foot and ankle. And you know, mine was completed in arthroscopy and sports medicine. But today we're gonna talk a little bit about rotator cuff injuries, how they occur, and what we can do to help treat and, and alleviate them. It, it's a maybe our most common cause of, of shoulder pain and dysfunction, and certainly in our adult uh, population. So as far as rotator cuff injuries and, and how these occur, uh, I'll go over kind of the ones that are, are less common. So relatively rarely, uh, we'll get a traumatic rotator cuff tear. Oftentimes we may see that in a little bit younger of a patient comparatively, but uh, traumatic rotator cuff tears, may be a shoulder dislocation, they may be from a fall, but this is actually the minority of, of those cases. And in those cases, we will attempt to repair and, and put that back anatomically to where it should be. You know, next most common cause in this one, we oftentimes hear about in the office, but you know, our literature is now kind of pointing towards this may not be as common as we think. And that is a rotator cuff tears due to impingement. So impingement causes a rotator cuff tear by abrading or rubbing on the rotator cuff, such as a a spur that's under the shoulder blade, those tears typically would occur on the bursal side or on the outer side of the rotator cuff away from the joint. A lot of our literature lately has pointed to that this is not a common cause of rotator cuff tears. And our most common cause is actually intrinsic degeneration. And there can be several factors associated with this, but intrinsic degeneration, we believe a decrease in blood supply, decrease in elasticity, and decrease in the ability of the rotator cuff to kind of repair itself. So when we think about a rotator cuff, you know, we're not just repairing a sheet or a rope down in there. This is a living, breathing structure that's in there. So. When that structure breaks down, and, and I always say when, whether it's bone or soft tissue or, or a lot of different other structures in there, you know, when we're young and it's optimally functioning, we wear down a few fibers and we break them down and then we heal them up and turn those over. And so we've got a constant level of, of turnover and refreshing of healthy tissue in there. As we get older, our bodies are not quite as good at, at this reparative process. So uh, when we think about the rotator cuff, it really is a cable. It's a bundles of fibers uh, that attach. And as we break down a few of those fibers and, and they don't get repaired, and then we break down a few more of those fibers, we're slowly breaking down more and we're not able to quite catch up. And as that gap gets larger and larger and larger, we slowly start to develop a tear. And as you, you may have an event that kind of finishes it off and it may become all of a sudden symptomatic, but there's actually a lot of rotator cuff tears out there. And, and sometimes people don't even know they have them. If, if you're 68, I believe the last statistic I read, almost 
28% of people have rotator cuff tears, whether they know it or not. Uh, and it really depends on the degree of how much that tendon is torn and sometimes even the location, if it's more central or towards the front or towards the back. And, and that can contribute then to how symptomatic that tear is. After we get over age 65, almost 60% of people, if we did an MRI of them off the street, are gonna show signs of rotator cuff tearing. So, uh, and I kind of start to divide these into what we would call partial rotator cuff tears and complete rotator cuff tears. Complete rotator cuff tears are where the entire tendon in a location is pulled off and detached. A partial rotator cuff tear is an area where we've got some of the fibers disrupted, but it is not completely detached. And what we have to remember is that rotator cuff, it doesn't attach just along a line, it attaches along a footprint. And a lot of our studies have shown the attachment site for that tendon is just short of about a centimeter and a half. So it takes a while to kind of wear through that to have a complete detachment. But as that happens, people start to notice they get symptoms. And symptoms oftentimes are pain, especially over this kind of anterior lateral portion of the shoulder. Uh, they may notice weakness. They may notice loss of range of motion. And a lot of people also complain about difficulties reaching behind them, and also sleeping at night is, is a big one. So um, you know, that is kind of the, the long and the short of, of why we get these tears. The rotator cuff itself, grab a little model here. You know, there, there's four tendons. The, the top ones, the super and infraspinatus, the front ones, our subscapularis and our teres minor on the back. Most commonly involved are the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. So the supra and infraspinatus, this model's not great, it's depicted more as one, and, and then the subscapularis, and they blend together, and some people will even call that a conjoint tendon. But the subscapularis up front and the supraspinatus also kind of post the groove where the long head of the biceps is coming through. So uh, concomitantly, we will oftentimes see uh, in its neighbor here, the long head of the biceps, some um, injury or fraying, and that is oftentimes something that we're having to address at the same time as a uh, rotator cuff uh, injury. So what we do for a rotator cuff, it really depends on the degree of the injury and how long it's been there, how much tendon is involved, and how long that tendon has been involved. So, you know, as we said, this is a, a living, breathing structure that, you know, the, the tendon itself goes back and attaches to muscle bellies that sit in the supra and infraspinatus fossas. Those muscle bellies, if they don't have anything to pull on for a long time, uh, it is kind of falls into the, if you don't use it, you lose it. And it can atrophy, wither up and become actually unrepairable. For tears that are partial, oftentimes we are addressing that non-surgically as our, our kind of first line treatment. Partial tears are very common. And a lot of times we can alleviate some of the discomfort through anti-inflammatory use, Tylenol. Occasionally, uh, we want to be careful with uh, steroid injections around the rotator cuff. Uh, if you have an incomplete tear, trying one steroid injection or maybe two if they're spread out appropriately is okay, but too much steroid can actually atrophy and cause harm to the rotator cuff. One thing that oftentimes we can correct with some therapy is there's only so much working room under the shoulder blade. And oftentimes through pain patterns, 
this shoulder blade will be tilted forward a little bit and that narrows that space under the shoulder blade. Correcting some of those mechanics can open that space up under the shoulder blade so we have more room to maneuver and use the shoulder. So those are kind of our, our go-to standards for uh, treating incomplete rotator cuff tears. Now patients that go on to have progressively worsening symptoms with a partial rotator cuff tear, occasionally there just is not enough square footage of tendon attached to still shoulder the load and we have to go in and repair it. Partial tears do have some emerging technology out there where we're able to actually induce some healing uh, through a patch uh, that has been used and we don't have to put in anchors and it is a little quicker of a recovery, uh, two weeks in a sling versus six weeks in a sling. But this is only for tears that are partial. Uh, and that procedure can help actually stimulate tendon repair. And we have to remember there's really two different things going on when we're repairing a tendon. We need structural fixation to actually bring the tendon back down to the bone. And in a partial tear, we still have some tendon attached. And then we need biologic healing. So the body itself has to heal that tendon down. Um, this patch has actually been shown to help stimulate, thicken, and actually get that tendon to heal. And when we don't have to put in anchors, uh, we don't have to worry about the structural part of it as much. It's more of a biologic repair. However, when we have a full thickness tear and there's no areas of tendon attached, then we need to address that mechanically. So usually repairing this, we're, we're doing this through a, a series of anchors that put in and we're bringing that tendon and actually reapproximating it, tying it down to the bone. So we've addressed it mechanically, but we also need the body to heal it down. So oftentimes, you know, you just don't go out and plant a garden. You actually have to till the garden a little bit to have an area to actually get things to grow and heal. So uh, arthroscopically, while we're in there, we're able to do you know, pretty much a keyhole procedure. This is all just done through, you know, a few to several poke holes. We freshen up the edge of the bone, we remove you know, any kind of tattered, devitalized tendon. So we have a good, fresh, healthy bone surface to place that tendon down on. And then we mechanically tie it down, but we have a good biologic interface so we can get the body to heal. The healing part of it's really important. And there's kind of a, a few things that are associated with rotator cuff tears, age, as we've mentioned, that kind of intrinsic degenerative property on there can, that can accompany that. Smoking, high cholesterol, and, and you know, if we look, those seem to be things that are uh, associated with this. So, but we can certainly give a little bit of a, a, a brought a, a little bit of a, a fake rotator cuff so we could uh, maybe demonstrate some of the uh, mechanical properties of, of how we get a tendon down. So there are many different kinds of anchors and you know, this particular one is, is actually made of all suture. So this piece on the end goes in through a small 2.8 millimeter hole, but it turns into about a four or five millimeter ball. So it can't come out. There are different kind of like inert plastics like peak or biocomposite on there and and this is more of a thread in type of anchor and as we said we're you know we used to just put in one row but now commonly we're putting in two rows because we're we're not just trying to get this to heal along a line we're trying to get that entire footprint down and the more square footage we can get under that repair the more biology we have opposed to each other to get it to heal down together and then we have a little device here that again we can reach in and what you have to picture all this is done just through small poke holes in the skin and we're kind of building a ship um, you know in a bottle uh, kind of effect 
So this is our, our fake rotator cuff, like this is a, a loose flap on here. And we're gonna take this anchor place it into the bone. I said, and we can set that anchor in place. Got more suture in here than I need for this. Your typical size tear generally needs two what we call medial row anchors, and that's as we're attaching on the inside part of the footprint. you can see that actually is a very small hole where there's a going in. So we're maintaining as much of that bone surface as we can. And then we will put this in this passing device. And again, this is what we'd be reaching inside the shoulder with. And you can see that passes that through the cuff tissue and allows us to pull it out. So you can see where that is pulling down through there and we will then tie that down. This is what we call a double row repair. And this again is so we can get as much tendon under the repair as well as spread it out. So the stress is being shared across the whole repair. So what we'll do is we have a certain types of knots called sliding knots where I can tie this outside the shoulder. And then actually slide that knot inside the shoulder to cinch the rotator cuff down. And then we would repeat and do the same thing with our other suture. And those knots are unique that once you cinch them down, they can't slide backwards. So now, We've got two knots on there, cinch down. So this would be what we would call the medial row. So we've got it tied down. Now what we wanna do is get this outer limb squared up where we get more tendon underneath the repair so we can get that to heal. 
So we're using a little different kind of anchor here where I need to make a little bit of a pilot hole. We'll make two of those. What we'll want to do, so you can see we've got two little pilot holes there now. We're going to take one suture from each of these anchors. And we're going to load it through this loop onto this other anchor. And it's got a little eyelet and I can punch that down in there. I usually like to cinch both these up just to make sure. And then we can load them. And we will give that a turn. There'll be a little suture that helps hold that inside, that hold the anchor together. We'll pull that out. And then we'll repeat the process with our other two sutures. And you'll see that that gives us kind of a nice X across here. The excess sutures trimmed off and basically we we end up with a repair much like that to get as much tendon back down to that fresh bone sometimes questions can arise if what if a tendon is not repairable and that can happen and a non-repairable rotator cuff tear can lead to arthritis so there are a couple of salvage procedures that can be done, something called a superior capsule reconstruction, because the rotator cuff really has two functions. It is to both provide strength and movement, but also stabilize the ball centered on the socket. Without a rotator cuff, it can rise up on the socket. And from there, it can cause both some mechanical dysfunction that lead to less movement and functional strength as well as you know physically end up causing arthritis because the joint's not congruent so one option is to put in a piece of cadaver tissue when there where there is no rotator cuff to help reseat the ball and center it you may not get all of your strength back but it may help with some functional movement and help with pain there are more rarely some needs for tendon transfers where a tendon from another part of the shoulder can be transferred in. That's usually done for more younger patients with chronic non-repairable 
uh, tenons. So uh, the last thing would be a shoulder replacement on there. But uh, that's kind of the, the long and the short of a, a repair and, and how we do it. But uh, we can get to some questions out there. Thank you so much, Dr. Eastwood. We have a lot of questions coming in after your wonderful demonstration. So our first question is, what is the difference between rotator cuff surgery and shoulder replacement surgery? And is the recovery time the same? It is definitely different. So repairing a rotator cuff, this is a soft tissue procedure where we are repairing a tendon down on the patient's own ball and socket. A shoulder replacement is done for arthritis, typically. And a replacement gives you a new ball and a new socket uh, on there. And you actually, to get a traditional cuff repair, you have to have an intact rotator cuff. We use a reverse shoulder replacement for people that have both arthritis and no rotator cuff. And that swaps where the ball and socket is at to transfer more of the load to the deltoid and outer shoulder muscles to help you both with get rid of the arthritis as well as has some increased functional movement. Approximately how long does the rotator cuff uh, repair procedure take? That can vary surgeon to surgeon, but I'd say my typical rotator cuff repair is somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, generally that's done under, obviously under anesthesia. And a lot of people will choose to get a block to also kind of numb the shoulder up. Thank you. This relates to your demonstration that you just did. When you were doing the demonstration, you used a hammer to make holes and to hammer things into the bone. Is that a uh, do you use a hammer in the actual procedure or is that just for the demonstration? Do you use a drill at all? Most of the time, if bone is really, really hard in a procedure, then sometimes we have to use a drill. Uh, a lot of times, especially in our older patients, that bone may be soft enough that, you know, I don't even need a mallet. I can literally just push it in. But sometimes we do have to use a mallet depending on kind of how hard the bone is to, to assist with that pilot hole. I need rotator cuff repair. I'm in my 50s. I'm not aware that I ever had a specific injury and I've never done any types of sports typically associated with developing this. I do have an autoimmune condition. Could that make it more likely that I need a rotator cuff surgery? It certainly is possible. Any chronic level of inflammation can be hard on, on tendon. Um, and, you know, after kind of the capsular side is exposed and we have some exposed tendon fibers, you know, some of the proposed mechanisms could be uh, constant exposed tendon to some of the joint fluid uh, at the margin of the, the rotator cuff. Is any metal used in the procedure? Will I set off metal detector? If you looked 20 years ago, we had metal implants pretty commonly used and, and they were spiral, kind of like the plastic one that you saw me put in. However, um, they're pretty small. It's it possible that they could set off, um, you know, a, a metal detector. But one of the big reasons that we do this is if we ever need to get an MRI again, metal anchors cause artifact, not necessarily that they're gonna get pulled out by the MRI, but you don't get a very good quality MRI with metal anchors in there. Now we have like, the anchors that I showed that are made of all suture. They're made of a peak material that is very biocompatible and, and uh, doesn't cause issues with MRIs or a biocomposite that slowly gets turned over into bone in a few years. What is rehab like after a rotator cuff repair? Rehab is exceedingly important. So, um, you know, as you saw, that tendon is attached to the muscle belly. So, especially with the full thickness tear, we really are protecting that repair for the first three months. Most studies show it takes 12 to 16 weeks to get a tendon completely healed to bone. We don't want you to get stiff during that time frame. So the first 12 weeks is really focused on the therapist helping move your arm for you. 
So you're not firing that muscle that is pulling on our repair. We keep you in a sling generally for around six weeks, depending on the size of the tear. And after 12 weeks, we're really work, working on kind of functional strength and movement. So I usually say by month four, pain wise, you're doing better, you're feeling functional, but it will really improve for about a year afterward. How do you make the decision that it's time to do surgery? How do you know when it's bad enough? Number one, that oftentimes is a patient decision. You know, fortunately, rotator cuffs, they're not they're not life threatening, but they're certainly, you know, function and, and limb threatening uh, as far as discomfort and lack of function and use. But from a standpoint, once you get to the point where it is a full thickness rotator cuff tear and you have symptoms, you have pain, you have weakness, that's our opportunity to, you know, intervene and actually get the tendon repaired to and healed down so we can prevent some of that permanent functional loss, prevent muscle atrophy, and maybe prevent the tear from getting bigger. What is shoulder separation and could that cause a rotator cuff tear? Typically a shoulder separation is a little different. It is usually a post-traumatic incident. So the collarbone, as it meets your shoulder blade, the acromion, has the AC joint. And if that happens, you can see this collarbone pop up and tear the acromioclavicular capsule there. And that is a shoulder separation. And usually that's a, a traumatic thing, whereas most rotator cuff tears, they can be traumatic, but the vast majority we see are, are not. Do partial rotator cuff tears here heal themselves? They can either scar in a little bit, or like I said, they are extremely common. They can become asymptomatic and not bother you. And that's where generally for a partial rotator cuff tear, our, our first treatment is always non-surgical. Is an MRI required to be able to see a rotator cuff tear? If there's no MRI, can a rotator cuff tear be diagnosed? Certainly can have high, high suspicion on a uh, exam. Um, the thing sometimes where an MRI helps is to determine how big the tear is, how many muscles uh, it involves, and maybe how long has it been there? Is any of that muscle atrophy? There is something called a CT arthrogram where you can get a CT scan and put dye in there and see if any dye is escaping out the glenohumeral joint. Uh, but a emerging technology uh, is ultrasound. And our physician, uh, Dr. Mahoney, in our office uh, is specially trained to help do this. But you can do an ultrasound of the shoulder, especially for people maybe that have a pacemaker, or some other implant in them that are not a candidate to be able to get an MRI or they're super claustrophobic, uh, an ultrasound could be done as an alternative to look at the tendon, the tendon insertion and physically visualize whether there's tendon uh, that's been detached. I just had rotator cuff surgery 10 days ago. Is it normal to have burning and aching across the top of my shoulder and down the front of my arm? It certainly can be. Um, you know, unfortunately, we haven't developed any surgeries yet that are completely, you know, rehab or or pain free. So there will definitely be some swelling, some stiffness, some achiness. And this area of the shoulder is a common place to get it both before and and after surgery. That should progressively get better week by week by week, though. If I have a partial rotator cuff tear and a torn labrum, how am I treated? Is it a rotator cuff repair surgery or something else? Typically the rotator cuff is probably still gonna be your dominant symptom generator. Um, labral tears, the ones most often that need repaired, um, whether it's anterior or posterior, are usually related to shoulder instability. There are a lot of labral tears out there that may just be frayed. They might just need a little cleaned up and shaved up and loose material shaved off of it, but probably actually don't need anchored or repaired down. The top of the labrum, uh, that long head of the biceps that we 
looked at on our model here, where that long head of the biceps goes in, it attaches on top of the socket to the superior labrum. Now, occasionally we will see part of that biceps tendon is partially torn or has torn off part of the labrum on the top. And that is a fairly common thing that needs addressed during a rotator cuff tear. And more of our literature has pointed towards not trying to repair that labrum, but removing the biceps tendon off of the socket and attaching it either in the groove or below the groove and getting that biceps tendon off of it so it's not pulling on the tear. Thank you so much, Dr. Eastwood. If we didn't have a chance to get to your question today, we will answer it in the comments. Dr. Eastwood, would you like to close? Yeah, well, I'd just like to thank everybody for, you know, hopping on and, and seeing what we had to say here. And I said it myself and, uh, as well as several of us across the entire state here. Uh, this is one of the most common things that we're able to address and help patients with. And, you know, don't be scared to get it addressed. It isn't always surgery. There's a lot of non-surgical things, especially on the partial end. And, um, you know, we'd love to help anybody out there that's having issues with their shoulder.